What we're going to do today is begin to introduce again the geriatric emergency medicine curriculum and I'm going to do an introductory lecture on the approach to the geriatric emergency patient. We call our curriculum CAMPER or CAMP ER, the care of the aging medical patient in the emergency room. This is a little takeoff after the CHAMP curriculum at the University of Chicago which was designed for the inpatient uh, geriatric patient. And with us uh, having an ACE unit coming very shortly next month, uh, we can also introduce some of the CHAMP curriculum to you if you have an interest. Do want to mention that this lecture series is supported by an educational grant through the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation, their section on aging and quality of life program. We have actually developed this curriculum as a collaborative effort between the New Jersey Institute of Successful Aging and the Department of Emergency Medicine. So what we've been able to do is to infuse geriatric principles and practice into that very, very unique environment, which is the ED. I have some questions for you to gauge your database in geriatrics. Some of this certainly crosses all internal medicine. Which of the following medications can negate the lipid lowering effect of statin therapy in the elderly? Aspirin, first sulfate, interferon, metoprolol, or phenytoin? Please click in your answers. Okay, and here are the answers. 5% said A, 20% B, 5% C, 20% D, and 50% E. We'll revisit this question later after we've had an opportunity to talk a little bit about pharmacokinetics. Next question. A gate time get up and go test that is timed between 10 and 20 seconds for an elderly patient who arrived ambulatory in the ED predicts which of the following? Frailty, the ability to independently live, minimal risk, of falls, mortality greater at one year, and E, the need for a motorized chair. Okay, so we have a, almost like a bell-shaped curve on the answers of A, B, and C, and we'll uh, revisit this one a little later. I'm sure some of you have been exposed to get up and go testing uh, through your geriatric rotations uh, as an outpatient setting. And one more question. Which of the following does not predict repeat ED visits or hospitalizations when using the triage risk screening tool in the ED? A, difficulty walking or transferring B, ED use in previous 30 days. C, five or more medicines are taken totally in a day living alone, recent falls. Very interesting, most people pick D. And we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. What we're looking at in the care of geriatric patients in the emergency room is indeed the perfect storm. We're all familiar with our US healthcare system. It is the topic you hear on CNN incessantly. The system's fragmented, it's overburdened, and when you add the elderly population to this group, it is certainly the recipe for disaster. We know that the elder population is growing very quickly. The Medicare system, we don't know what we're gonna do with it, but we all are pretty darn sure by the time of 2030, there may not be any money left in there to care for our elderly patients. And when you add the lack of geriatric emergency medicine training, when you look at the number of patients coming to ED as a safety net, our training is woefully lacking at this point. And we're gonna, this uh, program addresses that in a curriculum fashion. We have set up a curriculum that is competency-based, based on the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine and ASEPS geriatric task force that first uh, convened in 1996 and they developed a set of eight domains and 26 competencies 
in emergency medicine in the uh, year about 2005-2006 when the IOM report came out. These are the lecture series. I'm not going to read them. You can see them. But they add some data to your lectures that you've never had. The clinical implications of the aging process and how that affects your, your therapy and diagnostics. Drug prescribing and polypharmacy in the elderly. All of you know what a great problem that is. The geriatric patient with altered mental status is the bane of the ER physician. How many times a day does that happen when you get a patient from an ECF that says they have altered mental status? Anybody here? Anybody seen one yesterday? Yes, okay. And then when we add the geropsychiatric patient, we know even less about that patient. Uh, geriatric patients often have, in, a, in addition to dementia or even a presentation of delirium, have some psych issues that we don't understand. So this program does uh, address that. And then when we get to the ethical and legal issues, uh, understanding more about DNRs, DNIs, DNHs, the ability of decision-making capacity, you know, are you able to uh, determine that a patient can actually make a decision. All these things come into care, particularly in transitions of care and in whether you put them on palliative care, even in the emergency room. The rest of them are kind of garden variety topics, but they are geared towards the atypical presentation of these patients in the emergency room. The discussion of cardiovascular emergencies, as we know, the MI in an elderly patient often presents atypically. How many of you have seen an inferior wall MI present as abdominal pain or an altered mental status in an elderly patient? The geriatric acute abdomen will look at a lot of time-sensitive diagnoses that if you don't act quickly, these patients certainly die quickly. Uh, infections in the elderly will be discussed, not from just the point of view of pneumonia and urinary tract infections with urosepsis, which we're very familiar with, but also addresses the growing incidence of meningoencephalitis as a presentation of altered mental status in our geriatric patients. Needless to say, uh, the treatment of cerebrovascular accidents in TIA are hot topics in the elderly. Remember, over age 75, there are a lot of caveats that must be considered when uh, lysing these patients or sending them to endovascular procedures. Trauma in the aging patient is not simple. We're also talking about motor vehicular trauma and whether patients should be coming to community hospitals or should they be going to trauma centers when they are multiple trauma victims? And of course, acute and chronic pain management. Pain management in the ED is of the essence in all age groups, but remember that the aging population are often very stoic. Uh, the greatest generation of the 40s uh, from World War II, these patients won't tell you when they're really having pain. You know, you have to gauge that. They're not looking for medication. They accept this as a part of aging often, that they must bear some pain. So we're going to talk about that uh, as well. So why is this curriculum uh, different? Well, first of all, it targets that elderly population. They consume the greatest amount of our health care dollar, and they're, they grow, they're growing the fastest among patients being seen in the emergency department. We talked about the curriculum that is competency-based, and it's very ED environment specific. And we try at all times not to just have competency and evidence, but also, if we can, incorporate the best practices that ensure quality of care in a cost-effective manner. Remember, we can't admit all the geriatric patients that we did years ago. We're now under the gun to try to send patients to different transitions of care. We also know that it's rather deadly to be admitted to the hospital. So we're not doing a great service to a lot of our geriatric patients by exposing them to the infectious diseases 
in that environment. We know they never really uh, often attain their functional uh, capacity that they had pre-morbidly when they leave the hospital. We know they always get taken down to at least one notch. So we want to avoid that. And this whole set of lectures in this curriculum will be very suitable for any asynchronous learning that you might want to do. We're going to be posting it on the uh, POGO e portal. Uh, this is uh, the portal of geriatric uh, education. And we also will be very exciting to us. We will be placing a virtual patient which teaches how to use the confusion assessment method on the portal sometime after the first of the year. So it'll be very interesting to you because it takes a medical case and weaves in an altered mental status that could be very easily missed. And we know that we're missing a lot of them because the statistics show that we're missing about 70% of the delirium in the ED as a primary diagnosis. And when we miss it in the ED, our colleagues miss it because they take our lead. You have a trust with your, with your admitting docs, and what happens is those patients go into the ED, develop more delirium, and decompensate more than just sundowning. So as I had mentioned, I think you're going to really enjoy doing the virtual patient that we're developing now with uh, the collaboration of the University of Miami, which is one of our consultants for the grant. And uh, it'll be really neat to do, and at the end you'll know how to do a good confusion assessment method and also evaluate cognitive impairment in general. So now getting to the precise goals of this uh, presentation, what we're looking for here is to develop a very informed approach to treating the geriatric patient a little different than you do, uh, not just treating the patient based on age, but uh, treating the patient based on their overall uh, presentation. And I'm going to give you some uh, clues on what to use. There's a nice model that we're using that I suggest that you use to look at patients in this age population in general. We're going to look at the demographics a little closer to the baby boomers. I think there's only two baby boomers in this uh, class. Most of you are X generation and some are millennial. All of, the, all of you certainly younger than my children, so you know what group I'm in. <laughs> uh, we're going to discuss uh, not only that, but we're going to look at some quality care strategies to decrease hospital mortality and morbidity right at the site at the ED where the safety net is. And we're going to look at the crisis in general and how we can begin to change things to get ready for this onslaught of patients that are coming. And one of the most difficult things is ED transitions of care. Do patients go home? Do they get admitted? Are they placed on observation status? Do they go to a hospital at home presentation? Do they go to subacute rehab? Do they go to an extended care facility for the rest of their lives? So transitions of care, as we know with our own loved ones and our families that we've been exposed to these problems, are very, very difficult, not only for the patients, but also for their families. Here's a little bit of the demographics of EDs in general. And I, I, I think you know a lot of this, but in 2007, the nation saw 130 million visits. That's over 150 million visits now. In 2007, there were 4,500 hospitals seeing these patients. In 2008, this number decreased by 7%. And I can go further back to 1978, there were 1,000 more hospitals at that time. So what does it mean to you? All the smaller hospitals are consolidating to larger hospital settings. ERs are going from, instead of five hospitals with 15,000 visits, they're all now in the 75,000 visit ED, making it very difficult for you to get those patients through the system. The uninsured population in, in 08 was 47 million. It's over 50 million now. And these are all statistics that you've been seeing certainly uh, on CNN. 
In 2003, ASEP did, and the Robert Wood Foundation did a little survey, I think, that tells you what the tip of the iceberg was. What they found in the survey is that at that time, 33% of the patients were uninsured. 51% of EDs were operating over their normal capacity on weekdays, and 70% over capacity on weekends. 97% of the ED physicians felt that uninsured patients use the ED because lack of access to primary care, and we know that's a problem. I mean, we've created jobs to deal with this. Our nurse navigators have, have created a whole new area of uh, follow-up for us just to handle this primary care difficulty. And 93% of the pay, uh, doctors stated that they thought that just common diseases like hypertension and diabetes, that the uninsured had no access to medications. Uh, certainly, when we look at Walmart with $4 prescriptions now, that's a help. We now can direct patients to that. But what happens in hypertension and diabetes? 10, 15 years later, they're all on dialysis, costing the healthcare system that's already overburdened about $50,000 per patient. So our idea in not getting these patients hydrochlorothiazide or an ACE inhibitor on board for a mere couple of bucks a month is a travesty, right? So there's a lot of things going on in the system that need to be fixed. And here's one that you're also very familiar with. 93% of the physicians said they can't get specialty care, even for serious conditions, for their patients when they leave the ED. And you know we have that ominous on-call board that looks really great when Jayco comes in, right, and looks at it. But in all honesty, does it work? Very rarely. Uh, you're telling patients to be seen by their family doctors in a day or two, see the specialist as soon as possible. It's likely to be months before they see the specialist, unless, the, unless they got a Collie's fracture with a 70 degree angulation, you might get them in the next day. So I'm creating a really bad picture, but you need to know it because you need to change it. You're all familiar with the Institute of Medicine's report. In 2006, the report dealt strictly with hospital-based emergency care and pre-hospital care. And it was called hospital-based emergency care at the breaking point. This is something you really should take a look at. You don't need to read word for word, but you need to read this. It's sobering. What they, I took this quote from it because I think it says it all. The emergency medicine system is highly fragmented, underfunded, and overburdened. And we know that these are the things that happen when this happens. Overcrowding, ambulance diversion. We certainly have inadequate surge capacity. God forbid we have a disaster and we try to test the surge capacity that we think we have. I hope we never get to see it. What they did in this report really is not only addressed uh, hospital-based emergency medicine, but they addressed pre-hospital. And the, ba the emphasis was on emergency pediatric care. Now, fortunately, since 1983, the Emergency Medicine Services for Children group has taken this pre-hospital shortfalls, developed a really good research uh, group, and pediatric care in a pre-hospital arena has really improved. The problem is they never looked at the aging pro population in this report. So the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine knew this immediately came out with a nice journal article in 2006 that was strictly addressing ger geriatric emergency medicine. And uh, we all know that you as emergency physicians will always rise to the occasion. If more patients come, you find a way to see them, right? You don't say, can't do it, oh well, I guess they're not going to do so well because I just can't do it. So we're our, our own worst enemy when it comes to funding. When the state legislatures and, and, and Congress looks at it and says, emergency medicine is in trouble, we're putting them at the end of the line because they know how to do that extra effort, get the team approach, and take care of every patient that needs to be taken care of. So in a way, that works against us as a dual-edged sword. Let's look at the demographics of the aging population. 
The definition of a baby boomer is anybody that was born in the post-World War II period from 1946 to 1964. And what that says is by, by 2030, all of the baby boomers will have changed, turned to age 65. And when that happens from now till then, the population of elderly patients described as greater than age 65 will go from 37 million to 70 million. This will be fully 20% of the U.S. population. The greatest subset growing now is people are living to be uh, 85 or greater. And guess what? When these people get sick, they consume a lot of the health care dollar, right? So what are we looking at this population? This population is going to be a little different. It's going to be a little more demanding. They're better educated. There's less poverty. They're having less children. You don't see big families anymore of the, of the 50s and 60s with four and five kids. You see one or two. And this will be uh, the future is what we're looking at. And uh, the, you're going to need to be really culturally competent because the ethnic and racial diversity will be great in this group. In 2030, ED visits will total one out of four patients will be a geriatric patient. So now you can understand why we need to preempt our education now and get up to speed. We can't wait till 2030, but we'll be way behind the eight ball. The EMS systems lack training as well and even transporting older adults. Look at the ED visits grown in 10 years from 93 to 2003, they grew 26%. We know, as I mentioned, these patients are really more vulnerable to disasters. Look at what happened in Hurricane Katrina. They're more susceptible to infectious diseases that we see every day. All of a lot of it based on less physiologic reserve with aging. Drug therapy, always difficult. We look at the number of medicines that the average Jerry is on. Geriatric patient average is four to five medicines each, average. So drug therapy is difficult. And when they come to the ED, they require more of your time you order more tests, your treatments are more critical, and they frequently get admitted, often to ICU level. So the challenges have been there, and uh, we're going to need to address them sooner than later. We've known about this since the mid-90s. We've talked about it uh, already. The education we need to address now, and that's what this grant does. Healthcare needs, as we know, will be more complex. And we're certainly worried in the year 2030 of whether Medicare will exist. Remember, it's that magic age that you're um, uh, able to get Medicare for your healthcare needs is age 65. That's the first time. What are we going to do if Medicare is not there? Now let's take a look at some of the ways to, that we can approach the uh, geriatric patient. The traditional approach is the 1962 ATLS approach. American College of Surgeons, you know, treat the treat the emergency, the urgency, and everything else will fall into place. These patients are far too complex just to do that. And uh, a Dr. Hillary Siebens proposed this domain management model for geriatric patients that was really based on Engel's uh, biophysical psychosocial model uh, in the, in the, psychish, in the uh, psychology uh, uh, realm. So the first domain is the medical and surgical issues. This is really just diseases and syndromes. Everybody's very easy with that. But the second domain involves mental status, emotions, and coping. So we're now looking for cognitive impairment. Are they emotionally stable? How are they coping? Even their spirituality is important. Domain three is the physical function that we need to assess on these patients. That's what's different. These patients' activities of daily living can be basic, intermediate, and advanced. And you're all pretty familiar with the advanced ADLs are really that, that super jury that's uh, volunteering 
you know, at the hospital to help with uh, meals and, and, you know, that high functioning, uh, going to the casinos on Saturday night, playing the one-armed bandits, you know, that's quite a high level of function. But getting down to the basics and intermediates, very much more important, right? And then the living environment. We often think about when we discharge a patient, what is happening here? When they go home, who's home? Are they by themselves? Do they have a caregiver? Do they have a family member? How many of our patients, when we see the family show up with a geriatric patient says, I check them on them on, them on Tuesday and Friday, right? And then we find them on the floor after a fall with a broken hip, 24 hours later coming in as a disaster. So we look at these things and we think about them, but we get frustrated because we really can't change these things. It takes a lot of money to change those. And the system is already so overburdened uh, and expensive that it makes it very difficult. So you do the best you can. That's what we do. Now, if you take this domain management model and incorporate it as Dr. Sibens did initially with a ISAR method of, or a questionnaire that can be used. Uh, it is called Identifying Seniors at Risk, or ISAR. You can see there are six questions in the ISAR questionnaire. And I, I split them up. You can see they're not like one, two, three, four, five, six, but I split them up into their domains, medical, mental status, physical function. And really, all you need to know, if, if you think about these three things, that you're beginning to predict whether patients are going to return to the ED. So you're going to know what you need to do for planning. And that's, that's what I want you to take from the ISAR scanning. There also is a triage risk uh, screening tool that can be used at triage in the ED, which again takes a look at the domain management model and takes some specific questions again that uh, the more you have, the bigger the problem. You don't need to know anything more than that. But it gives you a way of looking at it. And the, the ISAR DMM model was looked at, and the more positive questions that you have on the ISAR model, the greater the predicting of repeat visits in the ED in 30 days, and even three repeat visits in six months. The triage risk screening tool helps to predict ED visits and hospitalizations in 30 days. And if you have two or more of the questions positive, it's already at a 62% sensitivity and a 57% specificity. So one thing that the TRST model did, it looked at living alone. And you know, I've always been uh, possessed by saying I'm not sending a patient that, is, that I just treated that's frail home alone. So what they found when they, they took the statistics in this study, uh, that living alone had no bearing, that all the other things had a bearing. And I, I don't know about you, but that's always bothered me. I cannot admit patients now just on the basis that I fear that they're going home alone and uh, with their frailty are going to suffer from that. So the question, again, and I'm just going to take a look at it. We went with uh, nobody picked A, 20% picked B, 5% C, 75% D, and 0 E. So I was the outlier, right? So you guys are really thinking the right way. That even though living alone is a problem, I think you're beginning to use your nurse navigators and using the resources that you have at a university setting like this, that that doesn't become as big an issue for you. I'm not going to bore you with uh, history taking. You certainly all know how to take a good history. But what I want you to do is take a look at what we should be adding to the history in a geriatric evaluation. We do want to know where they're domiciled because the transitions of care are going to depend on that. 
this is one of the most important things. What is the degree of their functionality at baseline? What is their mental status at baseline? And sometimes we have to go to family interview and, and physician uh, calls to find out what that baseline is. Certainly when they come from the nursing home environment, the transfer sheets are virtually useless, right, as we know. And we need to change that if we're going to make good, informed uh, decisions on who goes back there. And indeed, who should have been sent the first time? The good thing about uh, looking at uh, pacemakers and defibrillators and perm caths and pick lines and all, we know that in the elderly patient, they are true markers of significant disease. So look at them. And always remember that there are a lot of time-sensitive chief complaints in uh, geriatric patients. There's acute STEMI patients with emergent PCI got to move fast. Stroke and ischemic events, again, time sensitive, although we're out to four and a half hours at this time. Remember that uh, these patients, uh, geriatric patients with GI bleeds, do not tolerate blood loss very well, so they are very vulnerable to go into shock on you. And then, of course, abdominal pain all the bad things that happen to the geriatric population. Ruptured triple A's, ischemic bowel, perforated viscous, all very, very uh, serious conditions. So some of the caveats of the history really are what we said, to identify frailty. What is frailty? Frailty has never really been defined uh, and accepted in its definition by everyone. But what we know about frailty is that these are patients that are generally weak. They're fatigued. They have less muscle mass. They have less physiologic reserve. Uh, their, their ability to, to tolerate their social uh, environment is poor. So we know that overall, the uh, denoting of a patient as being frail is an ominous, ominous uh, sign. We know that uh, families will tell us that their, their loved ones sundown in the past. Listen to that when they tell them. You know, be, be careful when you admit those patients to make sure that uh, these patients are put on uh, delirium precautions. Uh, in fact, I have lots of patients that tell me I'm not admitting my mom or dad because I know what happened the last time I took them home after being in the hospital. They were no good for five weeks. You know, I couldn't, we couldn't deal with them at all. So better to prevent sundowning than to treat it. We did talk about treat, uh, screening for ADLs and screening for cognitive impairment. We talked about that gait assessment and the test that we call a gait time get up and go test. This is something that we don't normally do in the emergency room, but guess what? There are ambulatory patients that you can use this in the ED with. The test is very, very simple. Uh, they're sitting in a chair. You ask them to rise from their chair, walk 10 feet, turn around, back to the chair, and sit. The normal amount of time should be less than 10 seconds to be able to do that. Normal patients can do that very easily in less than 10 seconds. If it takes between 10 and 20 seconds, we can consider these patients have some frailty. And if it's more than 20 seconds, we know that these patients actually need subacute rehab or they're going to decline further. We talked about the activities of daily living. These are the basics, the more advanced instrumental activities, you know, the ability to manage your money in a checkbook. And we talked about some of the advanced as well. So the question. And I have the statistics here, 20% uh, said A, 35% B, 25% or 10% said D, and E was 10%. So we uh, did pretty good. The majority uh, picked uh, frailty as the, uh, the problem. So it looks like you've been exposed a little bit to uh, uh, gate time, get, a, can get up and go testing. When we look at post-hospital discharge outcomes, there is always functional decline in geriatric patients. 
Very rarely do they not. If we think they're at risk on admission for any of these, they are certainly worse at discharge. Any of the pre-comorbid risk will certainly say there's going to be fur further functional decline. And comorbidities, age greater than 80, if they have any sensory impairment, uh, hearing, sight, if they've been frequent hospital admissions and they have psychosocial issues, all these will denote further functional decline. And what are the outcomes when they decline? We get more ECF placements. Again, they, they return to the ED over and over again. The caregivers, you can see the stress in the families when they come in. And indeed, overall mortality has increased. They will consume more home services. And these are not inexpensive. And what's even worse, that by just admitting them to the hospital with their risks of decline, they are often victims of iatrogenic complications, really at the rate of one out of three. So that's a really disturbing statistic. The physical exam, no different when these patients are an extremist. It's a focused primary survey and stabilization. But once you've gotten past this, you begin to look at some caveats of the physical examination that are a little different for the elderly. Look at their degree of personal hygiene. Are they incontinent? Do they appear to have decision-making capacity? Are there signs of trauma that say they're frequent fallers? Do they have pressure scores, sores and skin breakdown? And if you look, you will find these things in most elderly patients with their uh, comorbidities. The diagnostic workup is certainly never, never easy. I always say that if you're thinking about something in a geriatric patient and you're thinking about doing one or two tests, I do one more. If I'm thinking about two, I'm going to do three. I mean, that's the kind of workups that these patients need. Very rarely can you turn a, a, a geriatric patient around with just a sugar check or an EKG quickly or just a pulse ox if they were complaining of shortness of breath. Multiple comorbidities tend to certainly expand the differential diagnosis and the workup. You know how many scans we do. We're even doing MRIs now and certainly a lot of Doppler ultrasound in these workups. ED treatment tends to be complicated because of the multi-system involvement, tends to be expensive because of the cost of the tests, the invasiveness when we can't get IV lines, now we're placing central lines, patients easily get intubated for any respiratory distress, a lot of the treatments are very dangerous, the antiarrhythmics, even procedural sedation has to be done with great uh, sensitivity in, in these patients anticoagulation and the risks of bleeding, uh, the risks of using pressors in the ICU, all very dangerous therapy. So ultimately, if you're successful, it all depends on their pre-morbid level. When you get down to it, of conditioning and nutritional status, both of which are very difficult to maintain as you get older. Drug therapy certainly is a problem with polypharmacy. And we know why JACO has instituted the reconciliation of medications. It is because geriatric patients often go to one doctor and they present their list or don't present their list. They get another one or two medications from the specialist. Nobody looks at their other medicines. Now they got two calcium channel blockers on board or two beta blockers. It sounds ridiculous, but it does happen. So we're doing our reconciliation in the ED for a good reason. And I, I think it's really underappreciated except in the ED. I use the, the Ziploc bag theory that a very healthy patient has a pint-sized Ziploc bag, which may have one or two meds in it. The intermediate uses the quart-sized Ziploc bag. And then when we go to the gallon size, we're looking at 10 to 15 medications in that Ziploc. And then there are some shopping bags, which you ever see the families say, when you ask them for the medicines, 
and you say, do you have a list? Here they are. And you get to look through that big pile, you know, uh, on the bedside or on the counter. So we know that it's true. No, look at the adverse drug reactions and the toxicities. I mean, are you thinking about these patients getting vancomycin and having hearing loss that may be permanent when they leave the emergency room? How many of your patients are on Aricep? Are you asking about diarrhea and dehydration? Lots of these patients get both of those on Aricep. And they can't tell you. If there's dementia, they don't tell you a whole lot. Think about it. Quinolones, lowering the seizure threshold, tendon rupture. They already are, are nutritionally depleted. Their tendons can rupture much easily. Uh, chemotherapy, we know all the problems of chemo, all the problems with Coumadin. A lot of them are neuroleptic agents for control of their agitation, looking for QT prolongation and arrhythmias. And uh, don't forget, in dementia patients, benzos don't do very well, right? They cause a lot of disinhibition, and those patients get worse. So be careful with those. And even using a lot of the SSRIs, we see a lot of agitation with excess serotonin in the elderly patients. Go low and go slow when you pick a medicine for a geriatric that's going to be a chronic med. So we need to know a little bit about the aging pharmacology when we predict and prescribe medications in the ED. And what we know is that a lot of medicines induce the uh, cytochrome P450 system. We know that a lot of them do. And what they may do, they may inactivate or negate therapy with other meds metabolized by the system. And one of them is uh, Dilantin and statins. The phenytoin induces P450 metabolizes statins, and we may not get the effect of the statin for the cholesterol, but we may get all the side effects from it. So no benefit at all. So be careful with that. Looking at adverse drug events in elderly people, this has been studied very well. 11% of all ED visits by geriatric patients are due to an adverse drug event. That is an incredible amount. And what's even worse, the 12% of our ED admissions of geriatric patients are due to adverse drug events. So these are things that we can change. What do these things cost you, the consumer? $76 billion a year for this. The average elder takes four to eight medicines. This is 30% of all the written prescriptions that are written by you and your colleagues. We know that in the post-hospitalization setting, you're going to get at least one more. That's just part of the, part of the uh, deal. So ER physicians need to know a little bit more about aging, aging physiology, and this course will address that so that you know a little bit more about how that specific pharmacology presents with your elderly patients having adverse drug effects. So that question one. Question one, 5% said A, 20% B, 5% C, 20% D, and 50% E. So the majority of you picked the proper one. Kudos to you on your pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic knowledge. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with the instant access that we have with our uh, smartphones and all the uh, ability to get to the internet. I think it's a, an incredible uh, advantage that you have as you're training in that environment. I guess we didn't need to know a whole lot in the 1980s because there wasn't a whole lot known. But uh, catching up to you guys are gonna be very, very difficult. I see those whip out that, uh, that iPod very, very quickly and give me the answer before I can turn around. So. Keep it up. I think it's a good thing. I think we'll make less mistakes by looking things up. I think it's really a good uh, thing to do. Now, let's look at transitions of care. We already talked about this. What can happen on an ED evaluation? Well, you can get discharged home. When you go home, you're probably going to go home with another prescription, just like the hospitalizations. You may be going home with further services because you thought about that domain management model. You're looking at the psychosocial issues. 
and you're probably calling the nurse navigator to see if we can get some PT in there or visiting nurse or maybe even a hospice visit for them as the family begins to know that this is an end of life care issue. We can admit to the hospital and from there we hope you get to go home and then enter this same uh, final environment. From the hospital admission we might be going right to subacute rehab or what's even worse permanent placement in an, in an ECF. Now we do have one more option here that, and it was coming at the time that I wrote this uh, lecture, but the next one is observation medicine. Observation is not an admission to the hospital. It's admitting to an environment that is in the hospital setting, but it is considered an outpatient environment. So these are patients now, the juries that are a little bit dehydrated, patients that need one or two doses of an IV antibiotic for their cellulitis, somebody with their DVT that needs to get their Coumadin on board, and if you can get them out in 24 hours, they go to observation status, not admission. It's easy to make an observation into an admission if it's necessary, if the patient is not responding, so that's not a problem it's more difficult to extend the observation period. And it's almost impossible, once you've made the admission to the hospital and it was an OBS type of patient, you've lost that admission for payment. So the hospital really takes a very, very big financial hit on that. And hospitals are having enough trouble even keeping their doors open at this time. So we all have to work with that. When we're considering discharging patients from the ED, here are some of the questions you really should ask yourself. Are their ADL baselines stable when they leave? Or do we think it can be easily recovered at home with the therapy that I've prescribed? Are there caregivers that are willing to assist in the transition to home again? Do they need supervision with their meals and meds? Have you taken that medication list and reconciled it and made any changes or deletions of duplicate medicines that be, could, could become a problem? Is the home a safe environment? Is it disability friendly? You know, can they walk around with the walker? Is there enough room for the wheelchair? Can they access the bathroom with their wheelchair? Are you asking those kind of questions? Doesn't sound like ER medicine, does it? It is, because we're going to have to make these decisions on transitions of care. We're, we're the key, we're the safety net, and what we do ends up being the lead for whatever happens afterwards. It's a big responsibility. Do we have primary care available? With our uh, nurse navigators now, we're able to find primary care physicians that are even maybe able to make a house call. And we talked about in-house services that may be needed. So when we are making these transitions of care or in, and that transition is into the hospital, I like to say that the ED has become the first day of hospitalization. The observation to me is the second day because you've done everything short of what could be done in two to three days in the hospital in the past would have taken two to three days, you've done that in six hours. And that's not fast enough, right? We need to get our patients in under the three hour limit. So it's a real, real challenge to be the first day of hospitalization and do it quickly and efficiently. And we've talked about these things, about uh, hospital courses being always complicated, protracted, and when these patients leave, unfortunately, they often require a transition of care that's a higher level than their baseline. Hopefully, it's only temporary. When you look at the four Ds, or the hazards of hospitalization, delirium is by, by far the most dangerous. Being missed by 70% of ER physicians and being missed by almost the same amount on admission unless you have a geriatric service to admit those patients to. If you do, they don't miss it. They are very cognizant of it. Deconditioning is always a problem. Anytime you get to go to bed rest, 
Just like the astronauts lose muscle mass, you know, in a week in space, if you get a week in bed in the hospital and you're 80 years old, you know, it's like a year in space. So depression follows with this deconditioning and altered mental status, and it's very underdiagnosed in elderly patients. They're often depressed over their medical conditions. Dementia, we see it undiagnosed in geriatric ED admissions, and we get those, that history from the family members usually. If you ask the questions, you will find out. And this is probably the, the most difficult patient with an altered mental status, is the hypoactive delirium patient that comes from the ECF and is either misdiagnosed as depression and dementia, or dementia, or both. Other hazards of hospitalization, fall risks, even in the hospital. How many of you as PGY1s have been called to the floor for a geriatric patient on the floor with a fractured hip or a fractured proximal humerus? Anybody? Yes, very bad. That is the death knell of that patient. Once you find them on that floor with a fractured hip at 80 years old, needing to go to the OR, and further decline, always eminent, it's the death knell. Foley catheter placement, well, Jaco took care of this. We are under the gun not to use Foley catheters. In the past, catheters were placed for helping the nurses to take care of the patient. These patients were constantly wet, uh, their skin breakdown was a problem, and we used them quite frequently. And we really felt comfortable that that was better for the patient. When I say convenience, I mean for convenience of caring for that patient properly. Nursing is very difficult in these patients, particularly the morbidly obese and, and patients that you just can't move very easily. But you can place them in the ED if you have a good reason, CBI, urinary retention, you're doing a therapeutic diuresis, like I had a patient uh, on Saturday that was an altered mental status, 80 year old, came in, family said, I think she had a stroke this week. She had some uh, slurred speech at times, she was confused, she was a little bit agitated. Uh, she had had a couple of TIAs in the past, uh, had had some arrhythmias in the past, but was not in atrial fib uh, at this time and uh, she turned out to have a calcium of 15.8 as the cause of her delirium. And this was secondary to CLL that had been under control with the uh, numbers in the 60s, not having chemotherapy. On arrival for me, her uh, white count was 109,000. So she had malignancy associated hypercalcemia you're all familiar with, these are the patients that uh, their tumors or their liquid malignancies uh, secrete uh, peptides that act like PTH. And this patient need forced diuresis with saline and Lasix as the mainstay of treatment. So I was able to uh, put a Foley catheter in that patient under the proper conditions. Wound care, try to document pressure-induced wounds whenever you can. Even if they're not complaining from the ECF, that's not their chief complaint that they've got a stage four sacral decubitus, take a look. Look at these areas and pressure points because we want to prevent further breakdown. When this happens, uh, again, it just complicates their care in the ECF and they're more likely to be on that merry-go-round of coming back to the ED every two weeks just based on their wounds themselves getting infected. Some of the ethical and social challenges for the uh, transition of care. I, you know, I, the ED is just a tremendous place to start looking for end of life care potential for a family. Most families really suffer in trying to decide whether this is a palliative situation, whether we should do everything possible you know, to treat the patient. So it gives us a chance to refocus with the families on things that they've been thinking about but just can't deal with. So it becomes a, a time when you can talk about life-threatening illnesses or even those with impossible recovery. Uh, what we're able to do is by discussing what are the options of care, 
which may be no care, may be just uh, palliative care or hospice care. This is what you help the families with. If you've ever been there yourself, you know there's a great amount of guilt by the loved ones on a decision to whether we let our parents or grandparents pass away, and we know we're not supposed to use that term, but in this case, I think it's proper, or do everything we can to get them three more months or six more months or nine more months, even though it may be at the expense of them suffering for those nine months. So it gives, families really appreciate the ER physician that is sensitive to this in a time of crisis. So take that advantage and use it to really help families as well as patients. Pain management, as we talked about, in the elderly, they often don't complain of pain like uh, young people do. They rarely ask for Dilaudid by name, right? Rarely. So take a look at the, whether they're agitated, whether their mental status has changed, whether they got an obvious wound. Try to put the whole picture together and treat them uh, for pain that you suspect may be the cause of their agitation. Manage, if you're using opiates, make sure that you manage the side effects because opiates in elderly patients cause nausea. They get a lot of pruritus and histamine release. They could easily get hypotensive and have a mental status change based on that. And nausea is a problem. All these are manageable with very simple medications. Palliative care, we've already talked about uh, the discussion of possibly end of life care starting in the ED. This is what we need to look at. We now have the ability to look at past uh, charts in our electronic medical record. We can see what's been done. We can see when it's been done. And maybe now we can begin to avoid doing repetitive diagnostics or invasive treatments that have been futile in the past. And you can discuss that with families. We just had a CAT scan of the abdomen seven days ago. The abdominal pain is such. There's a malignancy. What are the chances of us finding something that's gonna change our course of therapy? You may not have to put them through it doing the same test over and over again. Pre-hospital care, we're gonna to need to bring our pre-hospital people up to uh, speed. And the reason is that even though they have a 110 hour course by the EMTs, they don't address geriatric issues at all. The emphasis has always been on pediatrics because it's a vulnerable population. But the other vulnerable population at the other end is the geriatric population. Very, very similar in their needs as the pediatrics. What you might not be aware of that at this time, for every thousand ambulance uses, 100 to 167 are for geriatric transports and evaluations. That's pretty darn high. Uh, the Training Coordinators Council for EMTs in 2006 actually developed a course called GEMS, or Geriatric Education for EMS, and it's available in every state. I haven't seen anybody, I've been asking around whether they've taken this course and I don't know any EMTs that have. When you see something like yeah. geriatric versus how to cut someone out of a car, <laughs> I think you have very few firefighter EMTs who decide geriatric is the way to go. So you've identified a barrier. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I don't know how we're going to handle that. That's a pretty convincing argument, <laughs> actually. Disaster planning. Uh, this is woeful as well. Uh, we know that Geriatric patients are certainly more vulnerable than any natural or man-made disasters. What we know is that 70% of the dead in Hurricane Katrina were greater than age 60. What does that tell you? Very vulnerable population. Same thing, similar in the uh, 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Why are they vulnerable? Social isolation, impaired mobility, certainly. When you saw those tragic pictures in New Orleans, of uh, patients that were trapped in the city, you know, in their wheelchairs, unable to get out. Tragic, tragic. Uh, 
amazing and you saw that you lived that as an emergency physician and, and even as a medical student for some of you they have special needs how do you get them oxygen nebulizers wheelchairs complex meds they're just not available during the uh, first three to five days of any of those we saw that happen in Katrina and those patients died just from not having basic services that were needed Disaster shelters don't really, they're not really designed for elder patients in general. And once you get these patients admitted, if they're just being admitted because they're disaster victims without a primary illness, just to put them in to provide shelter, FEMA doesn't reimburse the hospitals for this. So just a little bit. Everything ends up being socioeconomic in the end. Some other few, uh, future recommendations. We got to do better on coordinating and communicating with our extended care facilities. 25% of the elders in an ECF will be transported to the ED at least once annually. We know that. Their illnesses different than community dwellers with the infectious diseases and the custodial care that's being given, not medical care. When you're at home, you're getting medical care. If you're in a nursing home, you get your DIG level checked once a year, right? Whether you need it or not. So all these things are a major problem. It's really not nursing care, it's really custodial care. Two thirds of these patients are in there because they're cognitively impaired. These are not normal patients that are in a completely skilled facility. We know, I think this is crazy. Uh, statistically, I found that 10% of transported patients don't have a transfer sheet. I think it's far higher than that. I think it's far higher than that. That is a wishful number. If it was 10%, I think I could deal with it. I think it's probably 80%. But that would be anecdotal at my experience. The information we need is not there, right? And we could spend an hour on what should be in there. And when we poorly execute these transports, we overburden the healthcare system again financially. A lot of those patients don't need to be transported at all. We know that. And it's not in their best interest to admit them to a dangerous environment when they don't need it. So all this is something that we're very familiar with and we need to work on. There are some alternatives to hospitalization and we already talked about observation status. I think this is going to help us a lot. If I can get that patient out in 24 hours, that jury, uh, I'm going to be very, very satisfied with that if I can get them back to their home in that amount of time. And the concept that was really looked at very, very closely and used at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital is the hospital at home concept. The Cochrane Review looked at it and said that actually statistically, if you treated patients in the home as if they're a hospital type patient, they did better. And these are the types of patients that did better. Pneumonia, CHF, surprisingly that this is now a quality indicator that we're looking at to decrease the number of admissions for. COPD, uncomplicated strokes that are old that need no no intermediate uh, need any urgent intervention. There are lower rates of depression in these patients, lesser transitions to ECFs, and the families feel more satisfied getting these services within the home. What is the uh, other needs? The EP workforce really needs to be trained. Physicians need to be trained, nurses, technicians, Hospitals need to focus on geriatric-friendly EDs. As I mentioned, the current treatment model is one of, of a trauma model, and it doesn't work uh, for geriatric patients. This is my hero. You know who he is? This is Banana George Blair. Uh, this gentleman is a, an incredible guy. He's 93 years old. As you can see, he's water skiing. His favorite color is yellow. As I said, yeah. use your imagination on his favorite fruit. This gentleman learned to water ski at age 40, barefoot ski at age 46, snowboard at 75, race cars at 81, oh, skydive at 82, 
bull ride at 85. I think I'd have moved the bull ride up here. Uh, it, what it tells you is that, you know, growing old does not have to be what we see when the geriatric patients are at their worst, right? There is such thing as growing old healthy and gracefully, and it exists. Look at May Laborde. At age 95, she got her Screen Actors Guild card. 95. You think she's got a memory problem with scripts? Probably not, right? Yvonne Dowden at age 82, she was ice skating competitively uh, at age 82. I don't get this over age 56 league. That's quite a, quite a, a number of age disparity in the league, right? <laughs> it's not like you're over 35 softball uh, team, you know what I mean? Harvey Bernstein at age 96 became a Random House author and uh, had a book called The Dream that he wrote. Herb Sean at age 75 cycled cross country in 47 days. So we go back to that first slide that we talked about. Can we avoid the perfect storm of the uh, need for geriatric care in this country as we approach treating one out of four patients in the emergency room to be geriatric in aging patients? We know that uh, we talked about the fragmented, overburdened system, the rapid growth of the elder population. This is being talked about as we speak. Can Medicare remain solvent? It's going to be one of the programs that has got to be cut in the future, if not yesterday or tomorrow. Lack of geriatric training and research, I think we can pick up here. I think by starting with courses like this and the leadership of the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, ASEP, ACOEP, AAEM, I think we can get the geriatric training we need in our residencies and the research spinoffs. With the help of the Reynolds Foundation, uh, a lot of research has been done in aging medicine. So can we afford the perfect storm? You know, I think we can. I'm an eternal optimist, I admit it. My glass is always half full, and I hope that I can keep that going as I approach uh, my geriatric years, which I am coming very quickly to, I might add. And through education and research, you are the well-trained professionals who can create the change in the U.S. health care system. And I, I give you that charge as the young leaders of tomorrow to do so. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much.